morning, everybody. Now that the judiciary and the executive have left us in peace, I think we can have we can have free and fair discussion. <clears throat> Honorable Law Minister in absentia, Honorable Justice Namviar in absentia, Principal Namviar, <coughs> Advocate General Krup, <coughs> President Secretary of the Alumni Association, my distinguished friend Mr. V.K. Biran, <coughs> lawyer friends, student friends, Ladies and gentlemen, my wife, my partner for 43 years is here, Ami. She's been my source of inspiration and encouragement. So, <laughs> Fiat Justice Araut Kaulam. Let justice be done, though heavens fall, is the motto of Government Law College. It's so brilliant a motto. And it's after a long time I'm hearing this maxim, you know. So it was very touching. Hats off to the Maharaja, who in 1874 thought of legal education for this beautiful state, which has a great history. Just 25 kilometers from Cochin, some of the finest excavations which have been found by the Kerala State Archaeological Society. <coughs> our, our, yeah. They can't hear? Is it on? Yes, yes. So you have these archaeological uh, excavations which have taken place in, I think, since 2007, which have now shown that Kerala has a history of over 3,000 years, recorded history. It's amazing, you have a fantastic synagogue which came here in the 8th century perhaps when the Jews landed here and uh, the Hindu Maharajas gave protection to them. So this is a state which is amazingly uh, cultured, amazingly secular. <coughs> you, I mean, rarely do you see today any program in the country and I have been to many programs which, be can, which begin with such beautiful rendition of a uh, bhajan and it was very nicely sung by the young lady. So it really reflects very well on the state and its people. Malayalis, of course, have contributed immensely to the development of this country. <coughs> Constituent Assembly had many members from here, and it's therefore we have had some greatest lawyers. My first brush with a Malayali judge was when just Chief Justice P.S. Poti came to be appointed in Gujarat. I was a young lawyer then. And somehow he took an instant fancy to me when I first appeared in his court. And till he left, I was one of his favorite lawyers and really enjoyed learning from him because uh, he was an amazing judge with fantastic sense of justice. Absolutely fantastic. And when Gujarat High Court was celebrating 25 years of its, uh, uh, you know, uh, its uh, setting up, uh, he appointed me as secretary in the committee to celebrate, uh, you know, so it was very sweet. I, I really enjoyed. After that, of course, we have had many uh, great occasions. But I must confess, today, I mean, I must uh, owe this invitation to the Alumni Association. I am grateful to them and uh, to Mr. Senior Mr. Biran. But what really brought me here is Junior Mr. Biran, because he, is, uh, he, is, uh, he has been a colleague. He has been a friend over a long time. And it is very difficult for me and my wife to ever resist his request. So here I am before you. Saturday is not the right day to discuss a serious subject, basic structure of Indian constitution and present day challenge. Saturday mornings, I love my weekends and I'm sure you do too. It's a time to sit across with chai and pakoras and maybe a glass of beer. But here we are discussing a serious subject on this Saturday morning. So let's uh, ask. <coughs> <clears throat> Basic structure of Indian constitution and present day challenges is a very interesting subject. You have asked me to speak on. The two are closely interrelated, especially in the present context. And now that the executive has left the uh, hall, I can say that the reason why it has become important is that the body polity 
has gone down to gutter in this country. We have a situation today where political parties across the board, it has nothing to do with A or B political party, have no respect left for the constitution. They do not follow constitution, they do not adhere to constitution, and they certainly have no idea of constitutional morality. They behave the way what they want to behave. They have tried together collectively to weaken, if not destroy, every constitutional institution. Every constitutional institution is today under challenge, sadly speaking. So, I mean, it's something which we will have to debate today. <clears throat> The power to amend the constitution under Article 368, which was originally 304 in the draft constitution, uh, <clears throat> is in plain language quite uh, giving clear powers of amendment. And this is something which we must understand at the outset, that the constitutional framers gave a provision which allowed the parliament to amend any and every provision of the constitution. <clears throat> The Constituent Assembly debated this power of amendment, Article 304, on 17 September 1949, extensively. And mind you, Constituent Assembly sat for 141 days. There were 23,000 amendments suggested in uh, the draft constitution, and 2,374 amendments were adopted by the Constituent Assembly. You can imagine the hard work that these brilliant young men and women, I'm uh, not young, I would say men and women of India, led by Dr. Ambedkar, Professor Rao, and others, you know, uh, did to bring uh, this great document, which I consider as pious as Bible, Quran, Gita, or uh, Guru Granth Sahib. It's an amazing document. Question is, should it be amended or not? <clears throat> the debates reflect very, very different idea, far away from basic structure concept. So I must begin by telling you what the debates actually discussed. Dr. P. S. Deshmukh on that day, 17th September 1949, said that no amendment which is calculated to infringe or restrict or diminish the scope of individual rights, any rights of the person or persons with respect to property or otherwise may be permissible under this constitution should be allowed. And this was his amendment that he suggested in Article 304A. It was not carried, of course. But he was very clear, he feared that day, that you should have a provision which expressly says that fundamental rights are untouchable. <clears throat> and he said that if such amendment was brought, it would be void and ultra-virus. The amendment was not carried, but he said that being so, being the inherent under the circumstances in which we are working, I and every facility should be afforded for amending the constitution. If you do not provide necessary outlet or safety walls for air for the storms to pass through, it is likely that the whole ship may be blown off. Mr. Brijeshwar Prasad said a referendum to amend the constitution should be provided because it's the most democratic option and is an appeal to the people and no democratic government can have any objection to resorting to referendum in order to resolve a deadlock. I am in favor of referendum because it cures, he says, patent defects in party government. This is very interesting. One of the members who was a Congress party member in the Constituent Assembly went on to the extent of saying that Constitution is a Congress document and therefore it is not reflective of people's will and therefore there must be a provision for amendment. I mean the amount of freedom that they had in debating in the Assembly was outstanding. I mean, imagine today a member of a party uh, saying something like this on the floor of the parliament or assembly. He would be next day, he should have noticed by the whip as to why did you do that. <laughs> but this is how they were. They were great, great men. Uh, Brijeshwar Prasad quotes Professor Dicey, who justifies, you know, power to amend constitution in these words. And I quote Dicey, trust in elected legislative bodies is, as already noted, dying out under every form of popular government. Just imagine this is what Professor Dicey said in the 40s or maybe late 30s. The party machine is regarded with suspicion and often with detestation by public spirited citizens of United States coalitions and that's the situation here today in India. Coalitions, long rolling 
and parliamentary intrigue are in England diminishing the moral and political faith in the House of Commons. Some means must, many Englishmen believe, be found for diminution of evils that are under large electorate, the natural if not necessary outcome of our party system. The obvious corrective is to confer upon people a veto which may restrict the unbounded power of a parliamentary majority. So this was the fear expressed by Professor Dicey that a majoritarian party can do anything with constitution, constitutional ethos and constitutional morality. He ex uh, Brijeshwar Prasad cites an example from Dicey to support for amendment, provision for amendment. Very beautiful example. The best plea for coup d'etat in 1851 in France was that while the French people wish for the re-election of president, the article of constitution requiring a majority of three-fourths of the legislative assembly in order to alter the law which made president's re-election impossible thwarts the will of the sovereign people. Had the Republican assembly been a sovereign parliament, Louis Napoleon would have lacked the plea which seemed to justify as well as some of the motives which tempted him to commit the crime on 2nd December. Now just see this. He gives an example that if there was a provision for amendment in constitution, the revolution wouldn't have taken place. One of the means of uh, amending a constitution is revolution besides referendum. But revolution is not to be accepted because that's really a very violent means. Clearly, Napoleon would not have done what he did if the French constitution had a provision for amending the constitution. Sri Kamath, H. V. Kamath supported the provision for amendment on the ground that Constituent Assembly was elected on restrictive franchise and then indirectly by provincial assemblies on separate electorate vitiating the assembly ab initio. Look at the humility of these men and women. They say that we must give power of amendment because we are not a legitimate body. We are not elected by people at large. We are only elected by a limited franchise. Look at their humility. Look at their, you know, way of telling future generations of India why you should have the power to amend. What happens thereafter, we'll see. <clears throat> but this is how they discuss. Mr. Mahavir Twaggy said, the maxim on which it is based is the whole conception of democratic society today. The maxim is that earth belongs in usufructs to all living equally and the dead have neither the powers nor the rights over it. So the constituent assembly members felt that we are going to die. We have therefore no right to say that this is the final document. We will live with it or die with it. <clears throat> he therefore said from this maxim it is construed that a generation is disabled morally to bind its succeeding generations either by inflicting on them a debt or a constitution which is not alterable. Dr. Ambedkar responded to these interventions by stating that Irish, Swiss, Australian, English and United States constitution in different ways provided for amendment. He called constitution a fundamental document, defining the position and powers of three organs of the state, the executive, the judiciary and the legislature, as also the powers of the executive and the legislature against citizens who have been conferred with fundamental rights. He said that purpose of constitution was not merely to create these legal organs, but to limit their authority. Because if no limitation was imposed, this is what he said, there will be complete tyranny and complete oppression. Now look at the prophecy of this man. He said the parliament will be free to pass any law. Judiciary will be passed, uh, free to interpret any way the constitution it likes. And the executive will be free to do whatever it wants to do. He didn't want that. Ambedkar was very clear. He then justified the power of amendment, stating, so far as this matter is concerned, it seems to me that a modern constitution can proceed only on two bases. One basis, to have a parliamentary system of government. The other basis, to have a totalitarian or dictatorial form of government. If we agree that our constitution must not be a dictatorship, but must be a constitution on which there is parliamentary democracy, where government is all the time and well, so to say, on its trial, responsible to the people, <clears throat> responsible to the judiciary, then I have no hesitation in saying 
that principles embodied in this constitution are as good if not better than the principles embodied in any other parliamentary constitution so ambedkar and his colleagues were very clear in their mind that constitution must have a provision for amendment and this is how they proceeded but it is with a caveat they felt that we are not really truly representative of indian people we therefore don't have right to um, impose ourselves on the future generations of india let them have the right to decide what they want what kind of a constitution they want it must be an evolving document it's an organic document this is how they felt in his closing speech on 25th september 1949 and i would tell the students to read that speech word by word every word that dr ambedkar spoke on 25th november 1949 is to be written in golden letters i have never seen a speech more prophetic than that of anybody in our country everything that's happening today he feared that day and i'll read that at the end of my speech how prophetic this man was how what a vision he had that 75 years ago this is what is going to go happen to india and that india is going to be systematically decimated by constitutional powers it's it's that man was amazing please do find time and read it he said we may consider each generation as a distinct nation with a right by the will of the majority to bind themselves but none to bind the succeeding generation more than the inhabitants of any other country this is how he felt ambedkar further said i admit that what jefferson has said is not merely true but it is absolutely true he was quoting jefferson jefferson those words were was were of thomas jefferson who was responsible for american constitution's draft <clears throat> these words uh, which i just read we may consider each generation as a distinct nation with a right but the will of the by the will of the majority to bind themselves but not to none to bind the succeeding generation more than the inhabitants of another country ambedkar says i admit that what jefferson has said is not merely true but it is absolutely true there can be no question about it he believed that assembly has not only refrained from putting a seal of finality and infallibility upon this constitution but by denying to the people the right to amend the constitution as in canada or by making amendment of the constitution subject to fulfillment of extraordinary terms and conditions as in america and australia but has provided a most facile procedure for amending the constitution so article 304 which is 368 now according to ambedkar was one of the most easy way of amending the constitution unlike many constitutions in the world clearly the constituent assembly deliberated on provision of amending constitution and consciously provided for the same on the statute salutary provision in it had no moral authority to bind future generation of india and under a rigid document however good or bad it might have been constituent assembly was humble and that's why it did so <clears throat> so far so good for first three decades two particularly 50s and 60s the supreme court of india rigorously followed this principle that parliament has absolute right to amend the constitution any provision of the constitution including the fundamental rights <clears throat> many judgments came in the early 60s 50s and 60s shankari prasad versus union of india 1951 supreme court <clears throat> then came sajan singh versus rajasthan 1965 supreme court <clears throat> and then came of course these judgments clearly defined what it was then came gulaknath versus punjab for the first time supreme court took the view that though article 368 provides no exception as to amendment the fundamental rights in part 3 cannot by very nature be subject to process of amendment and if such rights have to be amended a new constituent assembly must be convened for making constitution or radically changing it so 1967 is for the first time supreme court speaks uh, very clearly emphatically and says that yes parliament has a right to amend but it doesn't have right to tinker with the fundamental rights if they want to do it there must be a new constituent assembly lot of legal thinkers worldwide have said 
that constitution can be materially altered only by a new constituent assembly. In India, we made the effort, I think, uh, in, uh, when Mr. Vajpayee's government was there, uh, Chief Justice Venkat Chalaya Commission was appointed to review the working of the constitution. And uh, it did submit the report. But I don't think that report has subsequently since been adopted or acted upon by any government. <coughs> <coughs> Mrs. Gandhi's government did not like Golaknath's judgment, naturally, and brought the Constitution 24th Amendment 1971, inserting sub-Article 4 in Article 13. Article 13 of the Constitution has a very interesting provision. Very rarely it's been uh, positively interpreted. It says that fundamental rights are in Part 3, and Article 13 is part of Part 3 of the Constitution, if any law is brought, any order is issued, any notification is issued, which violates fundamental rights, then that law, that notification, that order would be void. That's a deeming provision that constituent framers provided in Article 13. So to overcome that, Mrs. Gandhi brings 24th Amendment 1971, inserts sub-Article 4 in Article 13, which excludes amendment of the Constitution from the purview of Article 13. <clears throat> and she brought a clause 1 in Article 368. The effect was that amendment of the Constitution would not be law within the meaning of Article 13, and thereby it would not be open to question on the ground that it takes away or affects the fundamental rights. So virtually judicial review was taken away so far as amendment of Constitution was concerned. Then came the judgment of the Supreme Court, the famous Keshwanand Bharti versus State of uh, Kerala in 1973. The ratio of this judgment is impossible to decipher because, you know, the bench of 13 judges, every judge has given a separate opinion. And I, even with great difficulty, I have not been able to understand what their ratio was. But they did for the first time provide for basic uh, structure theory. And interestingly, in providing basic structure theory, they excluded fundamental rights from it, which is very shocking. Because if fundamental rights are not basic structure, then I don't think there is any other part of constitution which should be treated to be a basic structure. Because ultimately, what are fundamental rights? These are basic human values. And these basic human values have to be protected, have to be uh, held to be unalterable. These, are, these values are God-gifted. They are not fundamental because the constitu uh, constitutional framers treated them as fundamental. They are fundamental because they are fundamental to human living, to humanity, to every society. No society can survive if these basic values, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, civil liberties, right to move freely, uh, freedom of press, all these, you know, right to do business, all these rights are basic human rights. So in Keshwanand Bharti, the basic structure theory comes for the first time, but sadly the judges exclude fundamental rights from the principles of basic structure. <clears throat> to overcome this judgment, Mrs. Gandhi brought the 42nd Amendment. So this is, you know, you realize now why it is necessary that uh, you know, the Supreme Court had to intervene and adopt this basic structure theory. Why is it important for judiciary to act today much stronger than what it has? Because these, you know, majoritarian parties, be it Congress under Mrs. Gandhi then, or be it present government under Mr. Modi, they can bring any law and have it passed because, simply because they have brute majority in the parliament. That may include constitutional amendments. And one of the reasons, and Mr. Uh, Honorable Mr. Vice President, Mr. Dankar, eminent lawyer and a good friend, uh, the other day suggested that Keshwanand Bharti requires to be reconsidered. And I did write a, a couple of uh, months ago in Hindu saying that perhaps he is uh, professing or he uh, has an idea of a presidential form of government in this country. Because there is no other reason why he would want to talk about basic structure theory to be removed. So, you know, you don't know what exactly the political thought is about. The people's will and political thought are completely at crossroads, at cross purposes. And the political parties, once they get elected, 
are never bothered about the thoughts of the people who elect them. In any case, every political party which has a majority only gets elected with one third of the votes of the country. It's never more than that. Out of 130 crore population, in, uh, I think we have about 80, 85 crore people voting. And out of them, 65 percent voted. And out of that 65 percent, 37 percent supported Bharatiya Janata Party. Therefore, effectively 25 to 30 crore people voted for Mr. Modi's policies. And yet, he would speak for the nation and would try and do what Mrs. Gandhi did, fortunately unsuccessfully, thanks to a very strong Supreme Court at that point of time. Now, what was the effect of Keshwanand Bharti? That Chief Justice Ray superseded three good judges, Hegde, uh, Shalat, and Vaidalingam, I think. Three of them. And Grover, sorry, Grover. And uh, uh, they resigned. So, you know, this is what happens. But judiciary should be ready for this confrontation. It should be ready to make sacrifices. I'm not sure whether today's judiciary is ready for that. But these were the judges who were at that point of time. <clears throat> so this is how the development took place <clears throat> over a period of time. The doctrine of basic structure has now become an axiom. It's premised on the basis that invasion of certain freedoms may be justified. For example, if freedom is related to cases of terrorism. The Supreme Court had in Kohelo versus Tamil Nadu a 2007 judgment, very beautifully written by Chief Justice Sabarwal, that application of a standard is an important exercise to be undertaken by court in applying basic structure doctrine. It was also held in this case that power of parliament to amend constitution and to make laws that exclude part three, including judicial review, is incompatible with basic structure doctrine. So they did make exception that this is terrorism is an exception. But I must say that Israeli Supreme Court, one of the finest judgments of the entire court, I think uh, Justice Barak, Chief Justice Barak speaking for the court, many years ago held that the kind of practices which the Israeli army was adopting on Palestinian prisoners, including you know tying their hands and legs behind their uh, 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 body and uh, keeping them in that condition for a number of days was unconstitutional. And Chief Justice Barak says that we know that Israel is facing existential crisis. But yet, if Israel were to allow violations of human rights, then it will be a saddest day, he said, for this country. Now, look at the approach that Israeli Supreme Court has. Chief Justice Sabarwal makes an exception for terrorism. In the name of terrorism, we know what is happening. Thousands of young men and women have died in Jammu and Kashmir and in the Northeast under the Armed Forces Special Provisions Act, which are where no scrutiny is permissible because there is a complete umbrella to the army, which as an institution I respect the most. But this umbrella today has enabled them to kill thousands of young innocent men and women. Yes, terrorism has to be fought. Nobody can say no. I am strongly of the belief that terrorism must be countered with strong measures. But there must be some, some sub supervision. We have none. Now, this is how the difference in you know, jurisprudence is. A country uh, like Israel, which is every day facing terrorist threats and is surrounded by enemies all across. But they, the court, Supreme Court took a very good view. And that's why Prime Minister Netanyahu, as law minister just said, is trying to do everything that's possible. It's possible to, you know, <coughs> overcome the judiciary. The basic structure concept, therefore, limits the amending power of the Constitution. This is the standard prescribed by judiciary to Parliament. So, for the first time, judiciary has told Parliament that you have right to amend, but do not amend the Constitution so as to affect or remove the basic structure. Now, what the basic structure is, we'll see. <clears throat> Supreme Court has a vital position under the Constitution of India and has a duty to interpret and decide if the laws, including the constitutional amendments made by Parliament, are ultra-virus or not. Judicial review is itself the basic feature of the Constitution. This being the position, it cannot be argued, as is being suggested in some political quarters, 
that Supreme Court cannot do what it has done. Mrs. Gandhi tried to undo the basic structure theory by the 42nd Amendment and failed. Yet in <coughs> fundamental philosophy, that fundamental rights are justifiable and they contain values imposing a positive duty on the state to ensure their attainment to the fullest is really the principle. It is universally accepted that rights, liberties and freedom of individual are not only to be protected against the state but should be sufficiently facilitated and that citizens must be duly informed about them. In this country, it's, I must say, and as a lawyer I take the responsibility, and law colleges also equally must take the responsibility, that our citizens are not aware of their fundamental rights. They are certainly not aware of their constitutional rights. And that's the reason why the state and the police can act as they do, you know, from time to time against the citizens. Human dignity is the cornerstone of this doctrine. Human dignity is the cornerstone of this doctrine. The right to life, even under Article 21, is not merely uh, physical or animal existence, but includes the right to live with dignity. State must take positive steps to protect these rights. This theory is based on the concept of constitutional identity. So constitution's identity really are these values, these fundamental rights. And that's very, very important. As the Supreme Court has observed, one cannot legally use the constitution to destroy it. And that personality of the constitution must remain unchanged. In Kohilo, Supreme Court says this, very beautiful words. How does the court de determine if a particular feature of constitution is a part of basic structure? The test to be applied as held in Kweshan and Bharti, Minerva Mills and Nagaraj cases is that one has to perforce per, 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 per examine in each individual case the place of the particular feature in the scheme of our constitution, its object and purpose and the consequences of its denial on integrity of the constitution as a fundamental institution of country's governance. Now if you apply this test, secularism, fundamental rights, parliamentary democracy, judicial review, independence of judiciary, these are amongst the many concepts which become basic features of the constitution. Without them, constitution will have no life. It will be a dead letter. It will be a document which is of no use to the nation. <clears throat> the Supreme Court has declared multitude of features as basic, including supremacy of constitution, rule of law, principle of separation of powers, preamble, judicial review under Article 32 and 226, federalism, secularism, sovereign democratic republic structure, freedom of individual, fundamental rights, parliamentary system of government, independence of judiciary, and access to justice among them. These are all basic features of the Constitution. If you think about them, you will agree that each of these features is so important for us as a nation. You know, Constitution is like a moral code that every family has. Every family expects that the members will observe certain code of conduct. They will behave in a particular way. And the moment one member tries to break that code of conduct, the moral code of conduct, then the family withers away. Now that's exactly what the nation is about. It's one big family. And it, it, constitution is a moral, moral code of conduct. Everybody must adhere to it. And if people or a group of people start veering away from it, tearing away from it, then naturally the very fabric of the country will dis get destroyed. And this is why it is important that all these functions or all these features must be, even multi-party system in a parliamentary democracy is an inherent part of basic structure as was held in Kuldeep Nair versus Union of India. Look at the situation today. Today the situation is such where I mean, uh, <laughs> Prime Minister Modi once said, and he said it to the press, so I can repeat it, that we want Congress Mukt Bharat. Today, I think what BJP wants is an opposition Mukt Bharat. Now, can any country survive without opposition? In fact, during the Constituent Assembly debate, one member went to the extent of saying that if opposition is not allowed to exist, 
it will be an act of sedition on the part of party in power. Act of sedition. He says he will be a traitor. Now, multi-party system is the basic feature of our constitution. You cannot destroy that by using agencies like CBI, ED, income tax and other agencies. And that's exactly what is happening today. That is why it's important for us to understand why basic feature theory is so important for our day-to-day -day living, our day-to-day -day life. Ambedkar had feared long back on 25th November 1949 in his last speech he says that will India lose democracy? And he answers the rhetorical question by saying yes, if there is a landslide, meaning election, as BJP has now and Mrs. Gandhi had, if there is a landslide, there is every possibility that India will lose democracy in fact, but will retain it in form. So we are today a democracy in form. There is no democracy in fact. The targeted attacks on critics, on stand-up comedians, targeted attacks on minority community, targeted attacks on opposition. What do all these reflect today? that today's India is really undergoing a massive challenge which is so difficult to overcome because our people are not conscious about their rights. As the minister speaks about Israel, look at Israel. 100,000 people protested in Jerusalem against Prime Minister Netanyahu's new reforms to, uh, to say the reforms are threefold. He says that Supreme Court if, uh, law we can overturn in Parliament. Two, Supreme Court, if it wants to declare any law unconstitutional, all 15 judges must agree. Even if one dissents, it's not a judgment. And three, that we must have right to appoint judges to Supreme Court and higher judiciary. Now, people are so incensed by it that thousands of people are protesting in other cities. Israel's best industry is technology industry. The technology industry has threatened Prime Minister that we will move out of Israel and go to Europe. Now look at our country. The minister speaks about, uh, you know, that there is no voice. But it's the political parties. What do they do? What are the irrelevant issues that they raise today? Do they not, do they not think that this is important? That these attacks which are taking place on judiciary day in, day out, where the minister goes on attacking judges after judges, the vice president attacks, the Lok Sabha speaker attacks. Why should the political parties not carry out demonstrations? and uh, popularize constitution, constitutional morality. But they are only interested in their power and absolute power across the board. There is no political party which is free from this. Every political party, unfortunately, only lives for its existence, not for the people. So this is where we have a responsibility as lawyers, law students, and law teachers to take the message to the people across the country that there is a fundamental document. It is as, as to be revered, revered as much as your own scripture. Maybe Quran, maybe Gita, maybe Bible, maybe Guru Granth Sahib, maybe anything. But you must therefore respect constitution as much. But that message is not percolating down to the people at large. And that's why the politicians can get away. That's why they have been getting away for all these years. <clears throat> The test applied in this regard is the width test and the test of identity to identify the basic features. The former being bound with the width of the power and the latter being no alteration in the existing structure. Constitutions world over have been amended either through modes of revolution referendum or amendment by parliament converting itself into a constituent assembly. But while resolution is out of a revolution is out of question and the referendum is not recognized in the, our constitution. The third option of parliament becoming constituent assembly is rejected by Indian Supreme Court. The question then arises, how does and why did the Supreme Court go against the wishes of the constitutional framers in propounding the theory of basic structure to limit the power of the parliament to amend the constitution? I think the judges were very, very right in not allowing the parliament to do what it wants to do, irrespective of what the constitution is. Yes, constitutional framers wanted parliament to have power, clear power, 
unbridled power to amend the constitution but the judges saw what the body polity had become and once they realized that they realized that we must put a check on this kind of amendments the amending power of the constitution because if constitution is amended as politicians wanted to be amended to suit their conveniences against the people we the people then nothing will survive of democracy in this country and that is how the judges acted they reacted and i must say that that's the reason why judiciary is respected so much today in the country that it is the judiciary which alone can stand between a powerful executive a majoritarian parliament and the people of uh, the country on the other side we can only be defended by the judiciary no uh, there is no other means to defend us and that's what judiciary has done so far and done it very well yes there are sometimes issues i am a great critic of judiciary also in many ways but that doesn't mean judiciary's role must be diminished in any manner or that we should not respect judiciary as we do we must <clears throat> the answer is simple mrs gandhi sought to bring about laws that were directly in conflict with fundamental rights so long as those rights stand on the constitutional textbooks it is but natural that the amending constitutional act would be void if it sought to infringe them the supreme court therefore rightly declared sub articles 4 and 5 to be unconstitutional this is what they did in minerva mills because mrs gandhi brought by 42nd amendment the, uh, 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 she added sub articles 4 and 5 in article 368 to say that no there will be no judicial review of a constitutional amendment and that we can do whatever we want to and they redefined uh, power of amendment saying that we can amend we can delete we can do everything supreme court in minerva mill said this is unconstitutional and since then in series of cases nagaraj uh, 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 kohelo and kihoto all these cases supreme court has consistently said that no this is untouchable if you think that you can do it we are here to stop you we will stop you so that's something which is very very important for us to understand <clears throat> india is governed by constitution and rule of law is one of its most important features parliamentary democracy is another feature judicial review and independence of judiciary is equally important and so are the fundamental rights of us we the people therefore any attempt to tinker with these provisions would make the constitution redundant it would never have been in contemplation of constitutional framers now i must tell you one thing when ambedkar and his colleagues were framing the constitution i don't think they ever thought that we are actually going to have people who will sit in parliament and take away citizens fundamental rights i mean they never thought that it could happen or that they will bring laws which directly impinge upon the fundamental rights they never thought that because they were perhaps naive they were good people they could never think of bad people in public life so but yet the ambedkar does give a warning and ambedkar says this warning is very interesting ambedkar says in his speech will history repeat itself he says will india lose democracy will history he says in the past we have lost democracy he says will history repeat itself it is this thought which fills me with anxiety this anxiety is deepened by realization of the fact that in addition to our old enemies in the form of caste and creed we are going to have many political parties with diverse and opposing political creeds will indian place will, will indian place the country above their creed or will they place creed above country look at this warning i do not know but this much is certain that if the parties place creed above country our independence will be put in jeopardy by a second time and probably be lost forever this eventuality we must all resolutely guard against we must be determined to defend our independence with the last drop of our blood this is what ambedkar says and today's political parties don't even put india beyond their political ideology they are only about party whip parties principles parties policies however much unconstitutional and wrong they may be however much they may be against the interests of we the people they don't want to put it beyond that they close their eyes 
the moment message comes from shri amit shah every member of parliament sits there and signs on a dotted line the farm laws were passed without a debate and the farm laws were repealed without a debate look at look at the irony is it conceivable that any parliament can pass laws without a debate that's precisely what is happening today you look at any act which is passed by parliament in last 8 years you hardly find any debate open up any all india reporter air of the 50s 60s and 70s and you will find that whenever laws particularly legal provisions are amended there'll be fantastic debate member after member will contribute to it so it, it's something which is very very you know sh shocking that's happening ambedkar said three things and i i wish to quote that he says <clears throat> as i said he said about landslide but then he says if we wish to maintain democracy not merely in form but also in fact what must we do the first thing in my judgment we must do is to hold fast to constitutional methods of achieving our social and economic objectives it means we must abandon the bloody methods of revolution he says second thing he says we must do is to observe the caution of john stuart mill which is given to all those who are interested in maintenance of democracy namely not to lay their liberties at the feet of even a great man or to trust him with powers which enable him to subvert the constitution exactly what we are doing he said that bhakti in politics is most prevalent in india in 1949 he says that because he did not perhaps like people worshiping gandhi ji and jawaharlal nehru so he says bhakti in politics is most prevalent in india he says bhakti is sure is good for salvation of soul but he says bhakti in politics is a sure path to dictatorship and that's precisely what's happening today bhakti we see all the bhakts around i mean the kind of worshiping that they do is mind blowing so ambedkar warned us that the third thing we must do is not to be content with mere political democracy look at our political class today we must make our political democracy a social democracy as well political democracy cannot last unless there lies at the base of it social democracy what does social democracy mean he questions he says it means a way of life which recognizes liberty equality and fraternity as the principles of life these principles of liberty equality and fraternity uh, are not to be treated as separate but as a trinity they form a union of trinity in the sense to divorce one from the other is to defeat the very purpose of e democracy so he, to him liberty equality and fraternity look at fraternity look at the polarization in the country where is fraternity today is there fraternity amongst the high caste and the low caste is there fraternity amongst the uh, uh, amongst religions you know kind of society that you have in kerala the every indian must be proud of we don't have that kind of a situation in gujarat where i come from there is complete polarization in gujarat today now ambedkar said that it will destroy democracy if you don't have fraternity and fraternity is part of preamble of the constitution very few people know that liberty equality are we equal the gap between rich and poor is widening every year i think the nation is content with having aban ambanis and adanis now do we want that kind of a society of course we must have industry i i respect industry i am i am a hardcore capitalist in my heart i am a socialist by action but i am a hardcore capitalist because i do believe that you cannot kill enterprise of people you cannot kill enterprise of people and communism or socialism uh, which we thought of really killed enterprise of indians since we have unshackled in the 90s under the leadership of mr manmohan singh uh, narsimha rao and manmohan singh we have had really this country is now going we are the fifth largest economy in the world and rightly so how are we going to feed 130 crore people if we don't have industry along with agriculture 
so it's very important so liberty equality and fraternity is ambedkar's you know message to all of us and that's something which we must really <clears throat> ambedkar closes this by saying that independence is no doubt a matter of joy but let us not forget that this independence has thrown on us great responsibilities by independence we have lost the ex excuse of blaming the british for anything going wrong if here after things go wrong we will have nobody to blame except ourselves look at it he says we have to blame ourselves and rightly so there is great danger of things going wrong times are fast changing people including our own are being moved by new ideologies these are his last words new ideologies fascism they are getting tired of government by the people they are prepared to have government for the people our political class has governments for their friends their families for them in more than one case we have seen that so ambedkar warned that they are prepared to have government for the people and are indifferent whether it is a government of the people and by the people if we wish to preserve the constitution in which we have sought to enshrine the principle of government of the people for the people and by the people let us resolve not to be tardy in the recognition of the evils that lie across our path and which which induce people to prefer government for the people to the government by the people nor to be weak in our initiative to remove them this is the only way to serve the country i know of no better he said these are his last words so ladies and gentlemen i must say that the constitutional uh, principles must remain you know intact you cannot allow the political parties simply because they have majority to do what they want to do and that's why supreme court has evolved this brilliant concept of basic structure it is an innovation and it is a path breaking innovation that supreme court has made innovation in the right sense our supreme court has contributed jurisprudence greatly for example administrative law judicial review of administrative actions uh, you know it started in england but indian courts have taken it to different heights our interpretation of article 21 right to life the supreme court says right to life is not just some animal life but life in the true sense dignity right to education right to housing right to clothing right to food Min all kinds of rights supreme court has brought into article 21 to make life very meaningful so this is how the court has <coughs> uh, really uh, done what exactly so in my view looking to what has happened in the country since mrs gandhi came into power in 19 Uh, 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 and what she started doing after 1971 uh, which led from time to time uh, to uh, executive or parliament passing uh, constitutional amendments which were direct inroads into fundamental rights the basic structure theory has served us well and it is here to stay for a long long time we as people was make sure that this basic structure theory is known to the people of the country what great contribution the supreme court has made how it is protecting us today how our liberty is safe in the hands of this law how this law is really you know looking after us looking after our welfare so this is something which we must important this is why the basic structure theory is important and as the present day uh, uh, challenges which we all saw which i briefly discuss but we see all the time i mean in the newspapers the challenge is coming the kind of challenges that our political class thrusts on us the people on a day to day basis uh, on our opposition parties which which is our view point on our you know critics on our uh, you know other uh, leading uh, 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 objectors to the government anybody government doesn't like the they are visited with all kinds of challenges so in these challenges in today's times please realize that things are really going from worse to worse it's not bad to bad things are going from worse to worse and we are not governed in the right sense today the governance is at its lowest ebb in this country today lowest ebb rule of law has become merely on paper it's there is no rule of law look at this 
I mean, a witness was killed in uh, UP uh, in a very serious uh, murder case. It was wrong. The persons who killed witness have done a great crime. They should be brought to book and they should be given maximum punishment. But it's important to give punishment in such a way that, you know, it will, he will live to live that punishment. So give him life imprisonment for full life to make sure that every day of his rest of 30, 40 years, he remains in prison and realizes that what he did is wrong. Now, what do we do? We pick up those alleged accused without bringing them to before judiciary and start killing them. We demolish their homes. Is this the kind of rule of, rule of law that constitutional framers wanted? This is a challenge today. You, you find in Delhi some locality where uh, certain homes are uh, constructed uh, maybe unauthorizedly. And you start demolition. Because why? Because members of minority community stay there. Now Delhi has some 600 colonies admittedly which are unauthorized. Some of them on government lands. And government has said so on affidavit in High Court and Supreme Court about this. One of the most well-known colonies, Sainik Farms, where the richy rich of Delhi live. You don't touch them, but you want to touch these poor people's homes only for you know, certain political compulsions. Now, this is not the rule of law. It is breaking down in many forms. Federalism is under challenge. Today, GST collection is being done. GST is a compromise by the states in favor of the center. So that, you know, center could collect one point tax and distribute it to the states. That was the understanding. Prime Minister Modi as Chief Minister of Gujarat for 10 years resisted GST. And in one letter went on to the extent of saying, over my dead body. But then when he becomes Prime Minister, he launches GST in the middle of the night, makes President Pranav Mukherjee also stand up and, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, inaugurate that GST. But today what is happening? Chief Minister after Chief Minister is telling us that the state's dues are not being paid for months and months on. Now, how do states survive then? The only source of income left to the states is alcohol. So what is happening today? States after states are pushing sales of alcohol in the country, which is not good for us. Which is not good for us. So this is how federalism is being killed. Eight state governments have been dismissed by luring away the MLAs. The Supreme Court says the test is only floor test. Now, these MLAs have already been won over 20 or 30 of them. They, take, they are taken in a chartered plane. They go and stay in a seven-star hotel in a BJP ruled state. And then they are brought on the day of voting. What are they going to vote? They are going to vote uh, against the party on whose ticket they got elected. Now, is this the floor test that we uh, really wanted? Is this rule of law? So, we are using constitutional methods to destroy democracy. These are some of the examples. So, we all have to think, each one of us has a responsibility to the, and duty to the Constitution of India. And I beg you, and I beg you to really perform that duty on a daily basis. Thank you very, very much.